the recording. Okay. So, whenever you want to kick off, Monica. Hello everyone, my name is Monica Short and I'm one of the lecturers at Charles Sturt University. Well, we're very excited to have you here, Trudy. Um, We've had some technical issues this morning, so to have someone turn up was really exciting. We well, we've very... got a few people, Monica, that we've had turn up this morning. Oh, Can you see them all on your screen? Not yet. No. No. Not yeah. yet. Let's oh, have quite a look. number. Oh, hello. <laughs> wow. Welcome, everybody. So I was trying to take the spotlight off you, Trudy. <laughs> oh, that's great. Welcome. Look Do at you need me to turn my camera off? off? Not at all. It's beautiful seeing your face. I think the others oh. may, may have only had a couple of faces on screen. Yep. No, that's very exciting to see everybody coming. It is great. Welcome, Okay. Everyone. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about online clinical skills training. And we've got a great team here to talk to you about the, the training. It's based on a research project that we've been doing into online training. Uh, so the team today, we've got Lachlan Kalash, who I think Lachlan's coming in a little while. We've got um, Bernadette Moorhead is actually an apology because she's on leave. We've got Dungi uh, Wa Mungai, Susan Melchek, Katrina goes back, Fred Valanda and Linnell Osborne and myself. And we are absolutely thrilled to be here with you. And before we go further, I'm going to hand over to Linnell to do the acknowledgement of country. I respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians, both past and present, from the lands where Charles Sturt University academics, students and partners reside. In particular, I acknowledge the Wiradjuri, Ngunnawal and Gunungurra people and Birupai peoples of the lands where CSU campuses are located. And I'd just like to add that I'm on Jutaroa land where I am. Thank you, Monica. The aims of, of the session today are that we're going to share the themes from our cooperative inquiry research that we've done into teaching clinical skills online. And we're going to present a case study of Charles Sturt University social work academics and their experience of teaching social work micro skills and group work skills online during COVID-19 this year. And we hope that we're going to be fostering national and international conversations regarding the pedagogy of online learning during a crisis. So the program today is we're going to introduce the cooperative inquiry, the actual pr the project and the research method, and then present the case study of Charles Sturt University teaching those social work skills online. We're going to have Lachlan talk about a learning technologist perspective on what happened, and then Sue talking about the associate head of schools educational managers linking perspective, then subject coordinators perspective a lecturer and tutor's perspective and then questions and answer panel. So at any time, please feel free to use the chat, um, pop any questions you have there and they'll be, they'll be gathered up so that we can address those in the Q&A section later on. Thank you. So the research project was a cooperative inquiry and it's been a lot of fun. We've really enjoyed spending time thinking about the theme. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about cooperative inquiry because we want to spend as much time as possible with our colleagues who are going to talk about the experiences of online teaching during a crisis. But just so that you know that there's actually been some rigour and behind what we've been doing and that it's trustworthy, we, what we've done is we've particularly applied this methodology. So we started with establishing our group and reflecting about what is the importance of online teaching during, during a pandemic. We then moved into collecting resources, most of which have been our own personal experiences of living through teaching online. Then we became immersed in the topic 
and we've moved into reflecting and starting to share the knowledge. So on that point, I'm going to hand over to Lachlan. Now, Lachlan might be late because he was coming from another meeting. Is Lachlan with us? Not yet. Otherwise, we'll come back to Lachlan. Mm. And we're going to hang out, hand over to Dungi and Katrina. Fabulous. Um, Dungi, would you like to start off? Yes, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Uh, and the thing to say about uh, doing the, the very fast uh, residential school online was uh, an amazing and interesting challenge at the same time uh, because it hadn't been done and we didn't know we were going to do it until um, maybe three weeks, if that, and, and we we're going to use new technology and everything. So there was a lot of learning that was needed. And three things that uh, stood out for me uh, were the, the, the flexibility and adaptability that we showed uh, everyone was adaptable and flexible uh, from the accrediting body uh, to the uh, people providing us with the technology. That's uh, uh, Lachlan, who you are going to hear from. Uh, as, as, us as academics, we had to uh, adapt uh, from the, the content we had uh, that were presenting face to face. We had to adapt it very quickly uh, to, make, uh, to be able to present it online. Uh, also, the students also uh, are very flexible uh, when we told them this is the way we are going to do it. Uh, maybe one student was faced by eight, but the other 186 students, uh, you know, were adaptable and quickly jumped on and were on board. Uh, so I think everyone that was involved uh, demonstrated that level of flexibility which is uh, a lesson that can be really applied in all other situations uh, when people are faced by an unexpected uh, thing like the, the pandemic. Uh, the other aspect that, was, uh, uh, that stood out uh, for me and I think for the whole team uh, was the level of trust. We could not have pulled it through uh, without that trust. We trusted ourselves and our ability to do it even if we had never done it. Uh, we trusted the new technology, which again, we had not used, uh, but we had to adapt and use it. Uh, so that level of uh, uh, trust uh, was very important. And it has sort of been extended to uh, in the research that we are involved in, the cooperative inquiry that also re requires us to work together, trust each other, uh, trust each, us, each other's uh, ability and vision uh, and skills. So that has uh, continued, continued on to that. Uh, the other aspect that, was, uh, that stood out uh, was the whole institution approach. Uh, everybody jumped on board. Uh, the university gave us the, the guidelines uh, in how we are going to conduct the uh, residential school online. Again, something completely new. Uh, informed the students what was happening uh, when students had issues like, oh, we have already paid our air fares and our accommodation. The university said, no problem, we are going to refer to that. Uh, so you can see uh, with that all institutional approach, we were able to pull through. Uh, and even when we were conducting the residential school, uh, we had everybody uh, really coming and joining in trying to know what are the problems that you have, what can we do to make this one a success. Uh, even the associate head of school was there every day, uh, ready to jump in and solve any problem uh, that arose. A few problems did arise as you can expect with a new technology, but we were able to resolve them. Uh, we were able to start together and pull it through. Thanks, Tony. Monica. Thank you, Dongi. Yeah, no, really key themes highlighted by you there, Dongi. And I know that Lachlan will speak after me and he'll really address some of the practicalities of how we did this from a technology perspective, which will, you know, give a little bit more context to what we're talking about. But for me as a social work educator, what was my core concern was how do we do this? How do we do practical skills-based 
face-to-face -face teaching online. So as you know, CSU is a, a large provider of social work education online. We have, you know, some of the largest cohorts in Australia. However, what we had never done before was try to teach and learn those practical um, social work skills online. So it was a really exciting and quite anxious and scary time for us as educators and I think for our students as well. So um, what I wanted to talk really briefly was about is what that looked like practically um, doing that and so, some of the things we came up against um, and some of you know our, our findings through what we reflected upon as a group um, post res school. So the first time we did this, we did um, a, a first year theory and practice subject where it was triad um, type role plays, and myself I facilitated a, a group work um, practical subject. So I'll speak a little bit to the group work practical subject. The way that this worked was that we used um, Zoom similar to where we are right now and we broke into separate zoom rooms so we got the student groups together and they had to form a group um, and work together um, in that situation as you can understand for a lot of students that's quite confronting I mean it's confronting enough coming into a student group and doing group work on campus as many of you may have done before but in an online environment and particularly in your own home environment there are so many other considerations so something that we found was that this was either a really positive thing for some students but for some students it was a little bit uncomfortable understandably as well as a facilitator, I noticed lots of different things in terms of verbal and nonverbal cues. So in group work ordinarily, you'll notice the students that are perhaps more confident in the group and perhaps take a more leading role and those who take a back seat in group work. This was no different in this format, which was a really interesting thing to find. Um, it didn't look much different in the classroom. But what was different is that those students who were who were more confident may not have been those who were more confident in the classroom. So in the classroom, I tend to find the students who are more comfortable in these group work situations are those who have a bit of experience doing that. However, within the Zoom room, I found those who felt at ease with the technology, in particular being on camera, being on microphone, were perhaps given a little bit of a head start or an advantage in the situation and could help others and build that rapport, um, you know, using that technology as a, um, sort of a leap board for that. Um, there were similar non-verbal and verbal engagement um, techniques used between students um, online, as you would see in the classroom. The one difference was that in a classroom situation for these group work groups, we would sort of float around. So um, in our larger campuses, we often, particularly at the residential schools, we'll have our groups of students spread out. And as a facilitator, we'll float around just observing the groups nice and quietly and not intrusive, obtrusively. Um, within this situation, we sort of, we did pop into the Zoom rooms to observe the practice, but I was inherently aware that, you know, it's you coming in. And my colleague, Linnell, spoke to this um, in another presentation where she chose to turn off her camera and turn off her microphone. So the students knew her presence was there, but there wasn't that visual and that audio to disrupt the um, skills forming and the group work happening. So for me, it was really interesting to balance those, but a really anxious thing right at the start on how do we do this well? There isn't a lot of literature out there yet talking about how we can teach skills online. And I think when social work education first went online, there was a lot of criticism, a lot of critique, and you know, it's such an interpersonal and um, face-to-face based profession. How could you possibly teach those skills online? But I think through this experience, we've started to learn that yes, it can be done and it can be done really well and um, our colleague Lachlan who is not from a social work background but um, from a learning technologist background is going to touch a little bit now on the practicalities of that and then in particular the technology that helped to facilitate that for us. Thanks Katrina and Dungi that was fantastic. So we're over to Lachlan now. Thanks Monica. Um, good morning everybody. Uh, introductions are in order. My name is Lachlan Kalish and I'm the Learning Technology Lead at, uh, for the Division of Learning and Teaching at the uni. Um, for those of you who have worked with me before, um, hello again and, and for those that I haven't met before, um, nice to meet you all. Uh, I was brought into this process basically um, to facilitate a number of technology-based needs um, and it was in response, obviously, to in, within a fairly short period of time needing to convert 
uh, the traditionally face-to-face -face experience into an online one using the tool set that we had available. So it wasn't that there was a kind of an open card to, to go out and, and, and purchase a whole bunch of new technologies or, or to, to purpose build any, but really to work within the tool set that the university has on hand. So if we look at that in terms of the main requirements for the, um, the project, if you will, uh, was to set up a, uh, an accessible medium online for students to engage with the staff and the resources as well as each other, um, to capture the attendance that was going on for the event, to um, in the instance where we had staff being exposed to new tool sets to provide the training for that. So in this case, it was to do with Zoom meetings and the Panopto meetings tool and aspects of Blackboard perhaps that they weren't familiar with. So if we're talking about the groups tool, for example, and how that might work. And obviously, um, one of our um, normal approaches to setting an effective precedent um, as a, a, a service provider for the as Division of Learning and Teaching is to make sure that, um, you know, we support the event itself in the first instance, particularly the first time it's run, to make sure that um, if there are any curveballs, and there certainly were for this, that we um, could deal with those as they occurred. Thanks, Monica. Okay, so a few background details for those of you that, that um, uh, weren't familiar with this. The institution had just implemented what they called a soft rollout of Zoom meetings, which basically means they don't tell you about it straight away. They have it turned on in the background and they try and transition slowly and calmly across from an old product like Adobe Connect across to Zoom meetings and everything happens at a nice pace with plenty of training, etc., available. And that uh, in effect didn't happen for the institution because of COVID, we literally needed to get everyone across into the new platform and using it very, very quickly. So that implementation happened in March. Um, the event itself, as we mentioned, it happened face to face previously and needed to all be moved online. Uh, we needed to talk about the different types of media that were gonna be used for the event. So that meant uh, thinking about whether or not uh, recordings were gonna be provisioned whether it was going to be via links embedded within learning objects, put into the learning management system or just emailed out to people, whether we're just going to attach things. We also needed to think as well about um, the way that groups had been set up previously face to face, how that could be reflected in the design of the online space. So those were the considerations that we had and the tools on hand, as you'd be familiar with, we've got Blackboard I2 as our learning management system. Video conferencing, we use Zoom meetings using single sign-on. So that means if they can log into Blackboard, they can log into Zoom. And um, a number of the academics were also using the Panopto CSU replay tool to capture their own recordings to augment the existing materials. Um, so where did we come at, um, at that problem to begin with? How did we approach it? We set up um, content areas specifically for the event. Um, within that subject site, I'll share that in just a moment. We set up three tiers of rooms. Uh, so over a hundred different Zoom rooms created in the first instance, thinking that we could pre-provision those for everybody. So that meant that the main rooms to use, rooms for the facilitators to use, and then ultimately rooms for each of the individual triads and small groups to be used. That didn't work so well, we'll get to that. Um, we used the registration tool in Zoom, which meant that we could capture attendance and print out reports and that we could get a heads up at the beginning of each day of how many people were checking in. We set up screencasts on how to do things. Uh, we provided cheat sheets for things like Zoom and Replay for those that hadn't used it before, along with the existing user guides. Um, as I mentioned, we pre-established those Zoom links and we also pre-populated the subject site. So look, I'm gonna share my screen for a moment. Uh, no, I'm not. Would you like to give me co-host rights, Monica, if you could please, or Linnell? So do I need to stop sharing to give you rights? No, no, I mean, I'll just, I'll, I'll take it over. Thank you. Got it? Yep. Okay, so we're in the subject site that was used at the time, HCS 200. And you'll see that a residential school area was created within the subject site and that we um, then organised that into days of the events along with organising um, pre-learning, post-learning activities uh, that were required by the students. And you can see that each aspect 
of the event was was acknowledged with its own nav bar item. So obviously, um, structure of the event, how that was going to work, the meetings, any associated documents, booklets, etc., had their own items. And you can see that that. The intention was, I suppose, in the first instance to provide as much information as possible along with supplementary resources um, were going to be in place. And we're, we weren't coming from a, a space where we'd done all this before and could tell what was going to be effective and what wasn't. We were literally just provisioning it all um, and running with that. So we've got embedded videos going in here made in replay and um, they, were, they were provisioned to the students as well. But what we'll find as well, I might just check the mute function. There we go. Okay, so what we can see here is that each of the Zoom rooms are the areas for each of those for the facilitators was created in here. So I'll go into one of them. And you'll see that the links to the rooms were there for the students as well as the small groups that were within that um, were then created. So um, the intention was there for the, for everything to be pre-created and, and um, intuitive for the students to access. Unfortunately, the way that this played out is that we discovered at the same time that Zoom doesn't allow one person to pre-provision um, a large number of meeting rooms on behalf of others, whether that was for students or hosts, co-hosts, facilitators, etc. The licensing doesn't allow for that. If your license is being used in one space, like this meeting, it can't be used in another space at the same time without people getting messages saying the host is in another room um, or do you want to close that other room? So we couldn't use all those spaces at the same time. It was problematic in that sense. And that would flow on from the facilitator rooms to the small group rooms, etc. So we literally had to react on the spot and either try and make sure that alternative hosts logged in or recreate the room so the host did it themselves rather than one person doing it in advance. Yeah, exactly. So that the rooms could be used synchronously. Um, you know, it's certainly possible when you create enough alternative hosts who use a scheduling tool, but these were lessons that we hadn't learned at that time because the tool hadn't had just been launched. So it's a really good question, Holly. Um, Zoom can be used synchronously with a large number of rooms, but you, there's an approach that needs to be taken in doing that. And that's using um, the scheduling function in Zoom um, so that they still have separate hosts or owners for every one of the rooms intending to be used. So that's a good question. I'll stop sharing, Monica, if you want to bring those slides back up. Thank you. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide, I think, as well. So we, we you know, we, we had those um, ambitions when we started, but the main problem, as I mentioned, was, was trying to pre-allocate all the meeting rooms without um, a better understanding of the way that Zoom licensing worked. Um, we couldn't use it in the same way that the previous tool had been used, Adobe oh, really Connect. And we'd um, also had um, the issue where we had a lot of the users had their own personal Zoom accounts. So they were logging into their meetings, um, not using their CSU login, which meant that the system had problems recognizing them. So it was an access accessibility problem that was based on private versus institutional use of the tool, um, which is a problem that we've since ironed out institutionally. Um, but not so much at that time, uh, you know, it was something that we had to discover. And also perhaps maybe from your own um, view of the subject site, just briefly, the potential that perhaps we were putting the information in too many places um, or trying to provide, uh, you know, too many um, objects in too many places. So that the next times we're offering them, we we're perhaps refining that streamlining that a little bit. Thanks, Monica. So, um, in the end, where did we end up? Well, we had a better understanding of the times required to, to set up and provision and resource an event like this. So that's from the perspective of my division. Uh, it also meant that we had a better idea of the tools that would work and how they would work um, than we did previously. Uh, we also 
we were able to set up a, a, a Google form, a residential school support form that the whole institution could use to be able to request support and help with planning um, residential school. And all of that was informed by this process. So the whole institution benefited from that. And it also meant that we did have an effective precedent because we were able to, to get through um, those hurdles that we came across and come out the better for it on the other side. So certainly there's gratitude from um, the division and the team that I was working with at the time for our chance to be involved in the event, that we managed to survive um, those problems and that the students and the academics involved came out the other side still smiling and thinking that, that things had worked out um, by and large really, really well for a first time. So um, that's my contribution, thank you. And can I just reiterate exactly what you said, Lachlan? We were amazed by how well it ended up. I'm hearing some background noise. I don't know if that's, if someone needs to just put a, their mic on mute. Um, thank you, somebody's done it. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it was a very exciting time, very dynamic. It wasn't easy, but it was very worthwhile. And Lachlan and everybody else in the team who's here really made the whole residential experience or the intensive experience, depending what words you want to use, go well. It was fantastic. So now I'm going to hand over to Susan Milchek and she's going to share a bit of her experiences. Thanks, Monica. Hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, so my name is Susan Milchek and I'm an Associate Professor of Social Work, but I'm also the Associate uh, Head of School of Humanities and Social Sciences. And what that means to be in that role is that I'm pretty nosy about everything that goes on operations wise in the school. And I was very privileged to be included in this particular operation. Um, so you kind of, in that role, you kind of get to be a bit of a jack of all trades and a master of some things. But what I suppose it is that I bring to the space is that I'm really passionate about learning and teaching um, pedagogy. And this was part of that, that role. So, so on behalf of the senior management of the school, how did I support the flow of this endeavour? Um, I think suffice to say that it was um, both simple and complex. It was a, a balancing act that was fueled by knowing what, knowing how and knowing why, very social science speak. Um, that is, while some aspects of the planning and execution may have seemed chaotic at times, really there was just busyness all around. There was actually a great deal of orderliness with colleagues just getting on and doing what they needed to. Uh, we all had confidence and strength that thoughts and ideas would be um, pretty, uh, pretty much, you know, an orderly process. Um, we come from uh, an exciting but orderly place. So um, these ideas that we were dealing with, you know, they've been debated and tested over time. And so there was a degree of predictability and calmness that actually descended amongst all of us. We had trust, as um, Dungi mentioned before, uh, in ourselves and in each other. We were in a unique situation because when you combine chaos with the laws of order, you actually get complexity. Uh, that's a pretty strong mathematical theme coming through there. So in what we were doing, there was spontaneity and this brought its own kind of linear orderliness. The albatross symbol that you see there on the slide is very dear to my own Māori worldview. For me, it denotes calmness, strength and depth and also skill. In social work and especially at the senior level, we come to the understanding of the connectedness between our own positionality and how that intersects with ideas we have about inclusion, exclusion, uh, about privilege and power. And by developing that understanding to a level where we can deliver such a residential school, we do so with a sense of the kinds of situations in which the people with whom we work find themselves. We develop a level of emotional, in emotional intelligence that guides us to not be alone to do things together and to stay connected. So we used um, 
different communication techniques and strategies. And one of those was with the use of fat communication. And we use that as one of the glues to maintain social relationships. Um, you know, a very simple example of that is the slide that Dungi and Katrina spoke to where uh, Bernadette also used a number of memes, for example, as a way of demonstrating phatic communication with her students and with each of us as well. So, you know, this was provided through just keeping in touch with others by whatever means. Being present, but not necessarily always visible. Saying things that are simple and light and believable. And on this slide, there's a couple of um, texts there, which actually come directly from Lachlan. Um, you know, he'd said to me a few times, leave it with me, I'll see what I can do. Um, or something like, okay, we have a slight problem, I'll get it sorted or I'll get back to you. So when I say things like sweet and light, simple and believing, just having someone with that technological nous and know-how just saying those things calmly to me and to Dungi was, was really like mana from heaven for us because suddenly then things became doable. From lack of awareness came awareness. Our thinking became, we are all in this together. And so we all supported the easy flow of work that needed to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And I think, there was a real camaraderie, like everyone did feel genuinely we're here together working on this, making it work. And from my perspective, having Susan and everybody else involved just was a delight because you actually could feel the support that was being wrapped around you while you doing this teaching. So from that point, we're gonna hand over to Fred and Fred's gonna share his experiences. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Well, I've been a lecturer in the human services and social sciences for more than 10 years. And I think I've been working with these residential schools for almost as long. And there seems to be a number of recurring aspects that seems to pop up. And, and I'm sure that everyone can identify with the notion of technology stress, which in part relates directly to the student's ability to engage with technology, but also associated with students located in, particularly in rural and remote areas where the technolo technological infrastructure in various places are, are restricted and which then influence uh, their ability to link up to video. The good thing with Zoom was that it allows for different ways to connect. So some students that either did not have, say for example, cameras for the computers, they can use their phones to connect both uh, visually and with audio. And I guess part of this tech technology stress, and it's not included in this slide, but it's, I think one of the most important aspects and learning experience from the residential school, and that's the act of kindness. And that relates directly to, you know, showing an understanding and compassion when things do go wrong with technology. Because we know that for whatever reason, you know, we sit there and you know, think, well, what could possibly go wrong? And there we are. For example, we had an experience where it took half an hour to get everyone, well, herd everyone into one uh, group room because we had various addresses and people were sitting in different Zoom rooms. And, you know, with a bit of calm resolve, the issue was eventually re resolved and, you know, everyone ended up in the right room and and by showing kindness there was very little frustration and angst coming out of that experience. I think the idea of online learning can at first be daunting in, in, its, in the sense that it might feel restricted 
I think my experience has been that it can be quite the opposite. And obviously the more we learn about different platforms, but you know, just such a thing to run polls with students and online lectures, where you can ask them questions, which they might be reluctant to, you know, raise verbally, but they can answer or answer a question by, you know, answering a poll or they can, you know, put the question into a chat box that no one else is going to see. So, you know, I have all those things that makes it possible to engage with students in new ways. Another aspect is also the equity aspects because attending a residential school is by no means cheap. It incurs costs for travel, accommodation, taking time off work, you know, and on top of that, then I had to take, you know, part of annual leave to attend. But then being able to zoom into residential school, that would have reduced the costs for students quite significantly. So there is a level of equity in uh, being able to attend the rest school in this way. And, you know, some one thing that has been discussed previously today is the flexibility of this. The fact that we can deliver a week's worth of teaching intensive lectures and workshops via Zoom, it creates a whole raft of opportunities to be flexible. You know, in terms of when sessions are held in the residential school where I was group facilitated, we had, you know, morning groups, we had midday groups, and then we had afternoon groups. So students could appoint to which group they prefer to be part of based on the life that they have outside their studies. Uh, how material is delivered through a mix of pre-recorded lectures and face-to-face -face sessions, and also to be able to engage everyone in the breakout rooms. So overall, I think it was a really positive experience for both as a lecture, but I think a lot of students also appreciate the ability to do it this way. I would just like to hand over back to Monica. Thanks, Fred. And I really agree with that point of, well, all your points, but that point about kindness was um, something that really stood out. Like every time I started to feel stressed or worried, someone would say a kind word and it was going to be okay. And then we could have fun together. And I think the students really responded really well to that. They could feel the kindness coming through as well. And um, and they started saying about, you know, this has gone really well. I'm really surprised. It, it was fantastic that way. So that was really great too, Fred. Thank you so much. So that's the end of our formal time with the, this session. So what we're going to do now is move into a question and answer time. So if people have any questions they'd like to put up, on, if you can put your questions into the chat box and I'll take the questions off the chat box and start asking different people the questions. To get us started, I'm just going to ask each person who's part of the presenting team, what is one thing that you would like to let somebody know about if they are about to do what we've just done and run online learning for things Oops, sorry, there's all this flicking going on. If, if someone's about to run online learning for something like residential school, what one thing do you, would you tell them? I'll jump in, Monica. Um, this isn't really any sort of um, well thought out advice or anything, more of an observation. I think we need to rethink how we build rapport. So when we're face to face, we have certain ways that we build rapport with people. And, you know, for us, we're well trained in how to do that. But it's totally different online. And there's no research or literature out there to tell you about how to do that. And it could go so wrong as it could face to face. So we found some of the things that were really nice to do is if, you know, somebody had their puppy on their lap and just to really gently go oh wow oh, who's that let us know his name and stuff but it, it can be a bit of a tricky because you can't really judge all of those non-verbal cues as well on a camera um, so you know I wasn't sort of pulling out the students that were sitting back and 
you know, not looking like they wanted to engage. But um, yeah, so I think rapport building looked a bit different, but was so very, very important. And particularly for us in the big lecture room, what we found is, you know, in a normal residential school, we'll have 400 students sitting in front of us and then us out the front. Whereas Zoom, we're all one together, aren't we? So um, even, you know, I think I started off one of my lectures with a little funny story of something happened with the kids that morning, just to break the ice and build up that rapport in that way, because it can be quite cold and isolating this sort of format. Um, so that was something that I found quite important to, you know, making everybody feel really comfortable. And it harks back to what you're talking about with the kindness as well. Who, who yeah. else? Will here. I'm, I'm fortunate after, after last week, I've now done all four of our residential schools by Zoom. I think one of the good things about being the, being the guinea pig here is I've never seen a residential school in person. So I, um, there was no change for me at all. I'm only uh, a Zoom residential schooler. I think the, uh, the few things and, and, and getting to know the other academics and lecturers as well, um, if someone's presenting and showing slides that other people can be uh, monitoring the, the chat box, one of the pieces of feedback uh, I took note of was that there was a lot more questions than we might get from someone raising their hand in a lecture theater with about 200 people in the room that um, the, chat, um, the chat box made it feel a bit more anonymous. So we actually got great engagement with that. Um, one of the things that also worked really well when it came to teaching counseling skills and um, these different these different models from you know cr doing a crisis intervention or an assessment was it was really great that we pre-recorded these and so we could play the recording and be there to pause it and say oh that's an example of Will asking a not so solution focused question <laughs> or look at how you know um, we didn't pick up on. Uh, some, some body language during this aspect of, of the interview. I think that it, it provided that sort of real time practicing these skills. And, and I think that was really good instead of everybody pause, we're gonna do an hour of a role play and then we'll talk about it afterwards. We could just pause a video and go, what are we noticing here? What, what's the next question you would ask this client in this situation? And I think that brought the sort of deliberate practice of what we're there to do to real life. And I think um, in that sense, I think uh, Zoom and the whole experience was something that was a really beneficial learning environment, uh, not only for me as a practitioner, but also the student um, as an as educator. Linnell? Um, You've yeah. got your hand raised? Yes, I did. I thought that would be a good way to go. <laughs> Is, um, what I was, <laughs> I can't lower it now, what's going on? Oh, that's a bit of a shame, nevertheless. Um, two things, one is it, at, in the beginning of every day, there was a time when there were no lectures and we could all just pile into the main room and that enabled students to sit and chat and some of us uh, lecturers and facilitators were in there and it enabled us to just, it was sort of like, almost like a coffee, a coffee shop type environment. And that enabled us to get to know students and their style. And some students who had a bit of tricky, challenging style, we were able to understand that that's just who they are and, and be able to work a bit more flexibly with them. And I think that was very important. The second thing that I'd like to say is, we've got adult learners. And what we find is that there are many of them had great skills and they actually helped some of us lecturers and facilitators and helped each other. And they were part of building that learning experience together. So it wasn't just, you know, pedagogy and then working in adult education. There was this other thing, other layer of these adults using the technology itself to build and, and strengthen. So that was, uh, that was really fantastic. I'm, I'm gone now. <laughs> and Fred, you've got your hand raised. Yes, I guess one of the things that I've been thinking of since we can only see this part, which really puts a premium on our listening skills, not, you know, what is said, how are things said, pitch of voice, 
because you know in in order to sort of compensate for the lack of you know all the bodily cues that we can normally uh, access so so i think that that is one of the things that uh, i think one need to sort of think of when doing this online environment thing Who else from our research community like to add something? Manaha, Susan, I'm trying to think who else. Dungi, does anyone want to add to a point? I think, um, I Monica, think. I just want to say one thing. Look, I think it's really important, the collaboration that we have with people like, like Lachlan and his team, and that we really embrace the, the innovative ways that we can deliver learning and teaching um, practice to our students you know I mean really the world is our oyster at the moment and we can we can just be confident that we can do just about anything if we surround ourselves and embrace uh, other people's um, knowledges yeah, mm, yeah true do we yeah I was saying that uh, we have demonstrated that it is possible and it is doable and that was great in uh, getting us through this very difficult time. Uh, it may not be a complete substitute to face-to-face, uh, -to -face, uh, but we can achieve a lot that we never thought uh, was possible before. Uh, but I think one of the, you know, one of the, the disadvantages is that you know, students can be uh, distracted somewhere, even uh, participating while they were also driving. And, or, or, or having a, uh, uh, minding a child. So that, that does mean there is that risk of uh, being distracted. Uh, but the fact that we are recording everything means that uh, they can be able to come back to it uh, at, a, at a later stage when they have time to concentrate. So nothing is really lost, even if they might be slightly distracted at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we have clearly demonstrated that it can achieve the objectives that uh, we intended to achieve in the in the face-to-face -face environment. Manaha, do you want to yeah. add something? Thank you, Monica. Yes, I would like to add. Um, <clears throat> this has been such an uh, insightful and useful experience for all of us. <clears throat> I delivered uh, two recorded lectures for one rest school, and I also delivered one uh, online live lecture in, uh, in the same rest school and on the whole uh, i was very much impressed about the way uh, the whole rest school was conducted because uh, for the last 20 years uh, in one or the other way i have been engaged with the uh, on-campus residential schools and i'm aware that how taxing it is for staff members and always even if it is on campus there are always issues uh, you know one or the other crisis happens and we handle it but this one um, was a entirely different experience because there was a different pressure and all of a sudden it was decided that it will be offered online in learning and teaching what we refer to it as that we require a free uh, unpressured kind of climate for real learning to occur. But this also proved that uh, learning can also occur when there is a pressure, uh, when there is some kind of uh, stress. And personally, I was quite, quite curious to, you know, some of the sessions I voluntarily attended because I just wanted to know what is happening and uh, how it is, uh, how the residential schools are run. So this demonstrated to us that, you know, that learning can occur uh, you know, even under certain uh, conditions which are not that favorable, but there is a pressure to perform and deliver, and uh, that helped us. The, uh, the second important factor in online learning is that uh, we, in one way we are very fortunate because uh, as our students are mature day students, there is a lot of self-responsibility and self-motivation is needed for uh, online learning. And when we say, when we have our recorded lectures and the sessions are recorded, uh, if the students are not able to come, 
or if the students are expected to read them before the session, um, it all requires self-motivation. Uh, otherwise, uh, it is very difficult. So we are fortunate that our cohort of students were highly motivated. Uh, they were able to read. And even we, the, the technology helped us to see uh, what article, what recorded lecture, how many students have read. Uh, one can track it that, you know, the percentage of the read and frequency of the reading and the time they have read. So in that way, uh, it, it showed that the students are able to go on their own and learn. So I think these are a couple of factors are, um, I think, crucial. Uh, and it also gave us confidence that only on-campus residential school is not the only way to go. And there are other alternative ways to um, deliver this uh, res these residential schools. And this, so this is another model. This is not the D mo D model, but this is uh, another model. And <clears throat> in some respects, we are also having some kind of resistance to online teaching, particularly uh, these uh, interpersonal communication school uh, skills. But this uh, residential, uh, these residential schools helped us to gain that confidence that uh, to some extent we can uh, teach these uh, interpersonal clinical skills through online as well. So I think on the whole, uh, though um, we have been reflecting and trying to see where we can improve and do better, uh, but this has been on the whole a very positive experience and it has also brought us together as colleagues uh, you know that in residential on campus school um, sometimes some of us are there and some of us are not there uh, but here without the requirement many colleagues have come together uh, to take the responsibility or be there to just to see what is happening uh, so uh, i have um, you know uh, i i live with very pleasant uh, experience and memory of this online res school, uh, even the way uh, Linnell and you have uh, are leading it in terms of reflection, writing, cooperative inquiry. So many good things have come out of it. So that that's all uh, from my side, Monica. Thanks, Madaha. And I totally agree. There's been a lot of good things that have really come out of it that I didn't expect at all. It, it was turned into a very positive experience, which at the time I was quite worried about. Um, I'm getting some messages that some people are needing to go. That's absolutely fine. We've only got a few more minutes left anyway. So just feel free to just go if you need to. But thank you so much for coming and attending with us. Before we wrap up, is there any more questions? You're welcome to put them into the chat box or if you want to turn your microphone on or um come oh we've got messages coming in to say thank you so just to wrap up i'm going to go back to the team again we've got a significant portion of our research community here that's looking into online learning in this way due to COVID 19 and like manaha was saying and the others it actually turned out to be a surprisingly positive experience and i'm just thinking, could we just share one thing, each of us just share one thing that we got out of it that was that was positive, that you weren't expecting? And we'll end on that note. Who I wants think to go for me, first? for mm -hmm. me, Monica, uh, being in that fast, uh, fast residential school uh, online, uh, what I appreciated the most uh, was the, the mutual support we gave each other. Uh, people didn't even need to be asked to do something. If they see something that needed to be done, uh, they just did it. Uh, you are a good example, Monica. Uh, I, <laughs> so you're the good example. <laughs> I had not been aware of a chat. It's, chat is something I wasn't used to. Uh, but you stepped in and said, okay, I, I'm going to be monitoring the, the, the chat for you and inform you when somebody uh, has got a question uh, that needs your attention, or sometimes you even answered it straight away uh, if it is something that uh, uh, you, you could uh, respond to. That kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, spontaneous uh, attention to whatever needed to be done 
was wonderful. I, I didn't ask uh, uh, Susan Milchek, for example, to come every day, but she was there every day mm -hmm. uh, and willing to support me uh, whenever there was an issue that, uh, that was needed. So that support was really the most wonderful thing uh, for that residential uh, week experience. Who wants to go next? Thanks, thanks, Jungi. Can I just sort of say, um, Monica, I just, what I love about this group and this team and this research is that every time we come together, I learn something all the time. And this mm. is, I think, the mark of, of being part of something like this. Like, for example, I'm looking up my dictionary. <laughs> I want to continue the conversation with you, Holly, about synchronistic teaching. And I'm just thinking, but what we did is, what we do is synchronistic. And so I'm going to, I need to unpack that with you at another time, Holly. But, but that's what I love, as, as, as I said, about these projects is that it gets you thinking all the time, you know. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say. <laughs> yeah, and I'll add to that as well, what, what Dungy and Susan just said, that I've, I've known Manahar and Susan for some time. And when I joined the team, moving on from being a, a sessional staff, I really didn't know many people in the team at all. And so it's been really nice. And, and I know like I have family um, overseas that for some reason, just because everyone is at home and in a lockdown, we talk to each other more often <laughs> than, than we would. And so one of the really nice things is, even though we, we, ha we had a lot of meetings and things like that, I actually just got to know more of my colleagues instead of just being email or distant people, especially because I'm a state away from most of you, that um, just being able to work together and get to know all of our passions and what we're interested in, I think that was really good um, as far as that experience is joining a new team in a different role. Who'd like to go next? Fred, Linnell? Manaha? Oh, well, I just wanted to echo the uh, team spirit uh, which uh, has been developed through this process. And uh, it is very pleasing that uh, we just uh, did not uh, you know, uh, leave the residential school after we completed them, that the work is continuing through the cooperative inquiry, um, uh, our reflections and writing. Uh, so we are continuing to work on it. Uh, so that pleases me that just we are not done and forgotten it. Uh, we, are, we are reflecting back to see what further uh, we can do uh, in this um, the residential school to do them better. Mm, Thank you. Mm, mm, mm. And so the point for me, oh, Fred, sorry. Oh, sorry. And <laughs> no, I mean, I would just like to reiterate this, you know, this how fun it is to work together. I think that can't be underestimated. And I would just like to, you know, thank everyone that's been part of all this because I think it's been an amazing experience. Mm, yeah. So this is this is Linnell here. So um, it was it was my smart idea that after the res school, I said we've got to write this up. We've got to do a webinar. We've got to share the knowledge. We've got we've got to get this out because what's happened here is amazing. And what's happened is that it wasn't only amazing what happened at the residential schools, but you can hear now that the process of the cooperative inquiry and us keeping on having the conversations and, and growing and changing and developing is been a phenomenon that, that's just really strengthened our relationships and it's strengthened our academic capacity and it's strengthened our teaching capacity and it's strengthened our confidence in using um, online technologies and engaging with wonderful people like Lachlan, who is a very highly skilled educator and technologist. And I think that's, that's where we need to be going, really building our skills and our capacities to work together and to move into the, you know, the next 10, 15 years, which are going to be unbelievably amazing. So over to you, Monica. So my point is I was very humbled 
um, to be amongst such amazing colleagues and students, uh, I just found the whole event absolutely inspiring. Um, I, when I, I, I must admit, I, I was cynical when I turned up to, to teach the first online residential school. I was turning up thinking, this is going to be awful, this is going to be hell, it's going to be overwhelming. And it wasn't like that at all. It was the exact opposite. It was just an absolute joy to engage with such wonderful colleagues. And the students were just brilliant. Mm. They, they dealt with everything really, really well. Uh, they were outstanding. And so for me, if someone said, would you do it again? I would do it in a heartbeat. It was just that much fun. So can I just wrap up on that point? Um, say thank you to our amazing team. Um, the inquiry team is outstanding. It's an honour and privilege to be with each one of you. And to say thank you to everyone who came and joined us today. Please email us if you've got any questions and we look forward to keeping the conversation about online learning for residential schools going. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.